Our text today is read from the first chapter of the letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Colossians, beginning with verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given me, given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. St. Paul, again, as he has in past letters, raises the subject of the mystery, the mystery to the Gentiles. And this, of course, is not only quite an issue and a controversy in Christianity today and throughout the past number of hundred years, but it's at the center, it's at the hub of biblical importance as far as the message of God in these New Testament times to the whole world is concerned. How can we speak of this controversy? How can we address this mystery again to amplify for the teaching purpose what the Apostle is talking about when he talks about that mystery that is to be made known and in this way to fill up the Word of God what is this mystery that God was so intent on having people know that he put the apostle to the trouble? I suppose we could address that controversy by a simple statement. Jew or Gentile in the mind of God. In other words, is God prejudiced toward the Jewish people? Does God favor the Jewish people. And in any eternally important sense, has God ever favored the Jewish people? Well, in the Old Testament, it might have seemed to be so. But that was only because of an illusion which was due to a misunderstanding of truth. The New Testament speaks much of this and calls up Old Testament truths in order to try to clear up the issue. St. Paul, as he wrote to the Romans, addressed this issue in the ninth chapter, well, really in the ninth, tenth, eleventh chapters, but I'm thinking specifically of the ninth chapter in verses six to eight, where he said, the seed was not in the flesh, but in the promise. The spiritual seed were the ones who were counted for the promise. And he recalls the ancient Abraham, and several instances 
and situations that happened to him. One was in the 15th chapter of Genesis when God made Abram, the name meaning the father of a nation, a promise for a natural seed. 400 years later, he said, your seed will come out of great bondage and the terror of darkness, which later proved to be Egypt, and would come back again into that land where Abraham was and where he was having that vision at the time, which was the land of Canaan. But then in the 17th chapter of Genesis, God appeared to Abram again and changed his name to Abraham, which was a greater term which comprehended a more exalted position, the father of many nations. And he changed Sarai's name to Sarah, which again was a greater term, a broader term, and it meant the mother of many nations. And then God said to Abraham, Abraham, to you and to your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Abraham was a barren man, or a childless man. His wife was barren. They couldn't have children. And so Abraham thought that the Arab child Ishmael must surely be the one. And he pled with God on that basis, but God denied that request. Abraham said, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, no, Abraham, I'll come back and visit Sarah in a miraculous way at this time next year, and she'll have a child. And in that seed, that child, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. This was such an incredible thing that Sarah laughed about it. We could talk a lot about that, but we would be diverted from the point at hand, which is, according to the apostle, as he explained this situation in Romans, and, and then again in the letter to the Galatians, that these were only allegories and types of this great truth. In Galatians, the third chapter, verses 14 through 16, the seed was not Isaac. Isaac was only a type of the seed, only one particular child, the apostle said, and that seed was Christ, and that seed was Christ. And in the third chapter of Galatians, the apostle said that was the covenant promise made to Abraham and to his seed in the 17th chapter of Genesis, and it was confirmed in Christ 430 years before this other covenant the covenant for the nation and the covenant for the law was established after the children left Egypt. And this law covenant, which was temporal from the outset and limited in its prospect and promised no eternal inheritance upon the basis of natural birth, implied nothing, the apostle said, with respect to this covenant of promise that God had made with Abraham in the 17th chapter of Genesis. That is what the apostle spoke of in the book of Romans, ninth chapter, and again in the third chapter of the book of Galatians. Nothing eternal, he said in the third chapter of Galatians in verse 18, ever came to man by the law covenant or by natural birth. It's important for people to understand that. The law, was a, the law covenant was an important thing. The national covenant served an important purpose, but it was not an eternal covenant. It did not have an eternal prospect. Nothing ever came to any man of an eternal nature through natural birth. The only way he could have had it was to earn it, which man did not do. And so the law was temporary, said the apostle in Galatians 3, 19 to 26, and again in the fourth chapter, Verses 1 to 5 is just like a man waiting for his inheritance to come. He said, we were like children under the law, shut up until this New Testament time should come. On the other hand, he said, the children of Abraham, the spiritual seed, the seed of the promise, were those who would be born to God through faith in Jesus Christ. These, he said in verse 26, 27 of Galatians 3, are the children of Abraham and the heirs according to the promise. Only those who were born again through faith in Jesus Christ. No others, no others were ever intended, ever intended to be heirs of this promise that God made to Abraham 
in the book of Genesis. On the other hand, he said very clearly in the third chapter of Galatians, in verse 28-29, that in Christ and in this new covenant, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, and there never was. We are all one in Christ. We always were one in Christ. God never, in the eternal sense, was prejudiced at all for or against any. There is no Jew or Gentile in Jesus Christ. This covenant in body is the only one that God has, the apostle said in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. In verse 4, there is one body. All of the differences that might have existed or might seem to have existed are all gone now. This is taught in the second chapter of the Ephesian letter in verses 13 through 22. There aren't any more differences if there ever were differences, and under the Old Covenant there were differences in a temporary sense, but those are all gone. He's broken down this middle wall of partition and taken both the Jew and the Gentile and dissolved them into one new man, so making peace, and we are all built together, not only upon the foundation of the apostles, but also, he said, of the prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. The Old Testament, with all of its components, and those would con in include the natural seed, the geographical kingdom, the earthly tabernacle, the Levitical priesthood, the animal sacrifices, all these are forever gone, forever gone. This is taught by Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the 8th chapter in verses 1 through 4. These old things were never anything in themselves. They were only types and shadows and symbols. If you want to verify that, read the fifth and sixth verses of the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews where you will read that these only served as types and shadows and examples of the heavenly things that were to come. In fact, God himself found fault with the Old Testament for its inability and prophesied the time when he would do away with it and make a new, new covenant, a new testament. This he prophesied in the 31st chapter of the prophet Jeremiah in the 31st verse, and it is repeated again in this context of the New Testament superiority in the book of Hebrews chapter 8, verses 7 through 13. The new covenant could not come into existence until the old covenant was completely eliminated. This is taught in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 1 through 15, and specifically verses 8 through 15, where it is said that the veil, as long as it was hanging in front of the holy place, was a testimony, uh, the holiest of all was a testimony of the fact that man could not unite with God. And that Old Testament had to be removed. There could only be one testament in force at a time, and that Old Testament had to be removed before the New Testament could be established. And, of course, again, the Old Testament included all of those component things that went into the Old Testament or the Old Covenant promise. God never found any pleasure in the Old Testament for its physical and liturgical qualities anyway. He never found any satisfaction in the sacrifices of animals in and of themselves. It was only, only, you see, as they made reference to Christ. And this is specifically spelled out in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, where Jesus Christ said to the prophet, sacrifices and offerings you would not or you had no pleasure in, and you did not desire them, what you really wanted was man in this world in your own image doing your will, O oh God. And this is what I came to establish. But this is what all of that old thing was all about. According to Hebrews, the 10th chapter, and verses 26 through 29, it is at least, listen to me now, at least sacrilege and borders on blasphemy to speak of bringing back old conditions as to the Jewish people, the failed temporal covenant, 
and the sacrifices. There remaineth no more sacrifices for sin, and he who despises Christ in the blood of the covenant wherewith he is sanctified is guilty of a serious offense. Christ, we were told, could not serve in an earthly tabernacle under a Jewish economy. He wasn't a Levite. He had no credentials. Moses spoke nothing about uh, Judah when he talked about the priesthood, the Bible says. Christ, as a Jew under the Old Testament economy, couldn't be a priest. He couldn't minister from the temple because he wasn't from the right tribe. And that uh, when God said to Jesus Christ, when he entered into the heavenly sanctuary, as we're told there, you are forever a priest, a high priest, he said, after the order of Melchizedek. Will Christ ever be a high priest in an earthly tabernacle after the order of Levi? Indeed not. Indeed not. The thought is preposterous. Now the fact is that God's plan from the beginning was for a people taken from all nations, not discriminated toward by race or religious heritage. And this we read of in the letter to the Colossians that we are studying now a little later on in the third chapter, verses 10 and 11. Now the problem is that men didn't know this because they couldn't discern this mystery that the apostle is talking about. But God in these days has revealed it to the faithful. Remember how we studied this in the Ephesian letter. How that God in, in chapter 3 in verses 1 through 9, how that God had given the apostle the gift and the calling and the grace to make known this mystery which was not known in other ages is now revealed by his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and partakers of the same promises by the gospel. Now this was God's plan from the beginning. Never in the eternal mind of God as he envisioned man and the fall and the Redemption of the race, was it ever any other intention of God? This was God's eternal plan in Christ from before the world was. And this is told to us in the Ephesian letter, chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. And again, by St. Peter in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. This which took place before the world was, this plan of God in Christ to bring all men to himself equally based upon nothing other than their faith in Jesus Christ. Natural birth has nothing, nothing to do with entrance into God's family. Nothing whatever to do with it. Is a Jew more likely to reject Jesus Christ than a Gentile? Absolutely not. Is there any difference between a Jew and a Gentile in the New Testament dispensation? No, there is not. Why not? Because they're children of Adam with a fallen nature. They must repent and come to God. That's all there is to say about it. Well, but what about the prejudice against the gospel truth that takes place in Jewish upbringing. Well, what about the prejudice against truth that bring, takes place in public institutions where children are taught that God did not create the heavens and the earth, that there is no such thing as validity, the biblical story of creation, that the moral law has no validity and no authority over people and you can do whatever you want, that homosexuals and other types of deviates have just as much right and privilege to live in a free society and be right as anyone else. I tell you, a Jew is much more likely to accept Jesus Christ if you're going to take their heritage and their upbringing into account than children who are brainwashed by these mindless, witless creatures of the dark in what we call the enlightened era of today. Of course these things are deterrents to accepting Jesus Christ, but it isn't in the genes. It isn't in the nationality. What you're taught as a child will influence you. There is no question about it, but it has 
nothing to do with race. In Jesus Christ, they are neither Jew nor Gentile. We are naive and we are misleading when we tell people, well, Jews can't accept Jesus Christ because there's something in their genealogy that just keeps them from it. This is unadulterated nonsense from the biblical point of view. There isn't any validity to it. According to the scriptures, natural birth has nothing whatever to do with it. Read about this in the first chapter of John, verses 1 through uh, 11 through 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God who were born not of blood, nor of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. No, said Jesus to the great religious zealot, Jewish scholar Nicodemus, natural birth doesn't stand you in any kind of stead to see or to hear or to know or to understand. Unless a man is reborn, unless he is spiritually born, unless he is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. doesn't have anything to do with the fact that here was a man who was steeped in Judaism, trained in theology, and perfunctory in his subscription to his traditional upbringings. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got the same problem as every other man. You aren't born spiritually, and that's what you must do, and it's no more difficult for you than it is for anyone else, and it's no less. St. Peter said in the first chapter of St. Uh, Peter's letter and, and the first book, verse 34, Thanks be to God who has begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled which fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. Thanks be to God who has begotten us again. Another birth, you see, a spiritual birth, natural birth, hasn't got anything to do with it. What is the problem with dispensationalism today who has all of this nonsense about Jewish economies coming back and Jewish people being the still the favored people and the favored nation of God under the New Testament and so on. Well, this is a pseudo-spiritual, pseudo-intellectual, pseudo-scholarship form of rationalism that, that lacks spiritual insight. It is devoid of spiritual understanding. If you want to get a little insight into why that is true, read the first and second chapters of First Corinthians, and you will find that the wisest man in this world is not in tune with God on the basis of revelation and the enlightened mind, and that religion doesn't help. Simplicity, faith toward God, the receiving of the things of the Word of God, the leaving of human cleverness and intellect out of it, and so on, are the ways in which man comes to know truth. God reveals it by his spirit. When I read about the spiritualism and the intellectualism of dispensationalism, it reminds me of grape nuts, which are neither grapes nor nuts. Are those who speak of Jewish privilege really for the Jews? Are they really? You know, this reminds me of what we hear in society today about black people. And all these reporters and would-be sociologists are jumping up and pointing their fingers and screaming for privilege and for tolerance and for all this thing for black people. And you see what they're doing is propounding the division. It's insincere. It is hypocritical. It's their way of constantly manifesting what they think is their superiority. We've got a black man in a cage over here. We've got a converted yellow man. They might as well say we've got a, a trained seal or whatever. You see, it's, it's a way of manifesting your own sense of superiority. 
dispensational Christians by the numbers speak of these wonderful and blessed Jewish people who are born twice the people of God and who are going to rule the earth someday, but you let one of them come in this community, and I can tell you some examples if you're interested. One of them bought a restaurant here not long ago, and you know who boycotted him? All of these good dispensational Christian people after church on Sunday who said, there's God's favored person, and someday he's going to rule this earth, but it's our show now, and we don't want him around. You see, Jesus talked to these kind of people who said, we're going to go out and put flowers on the tombs of the martyrs. And Jesus said, you bunch of phonies, you hypocrites, if you could only see what you're doing, how you're giving away your value system and your falseness, you see. All of this talk of the privilege of the Jewish people making them different from other people when they are no different is only a way of the proprietor of that doctrine doctrine manifesting what he thinks is his own superiority in the present time. Don't you know that the only way not to be prejudiced is to regard a man as a man? Not a black man, not a red man, not a white man, not a brown man, not a yellow man, not a Jewish man, but a man, you see. That's what he is. And in Jesus Christ, that's the way it is. They are neither Jew nor Gentile. They are neither bond nor free. They are neither barbarian nor Scythian. Don't you know that that is what the Bible teaches? My friend, there is no difference in Christ between Jews and Gentiles. What are the real issues here? Well, God wants people to know that in Christ they all have equal access to him. This is what life and truth is all about. God is not prejudiced. We are not withheld. We have total access to God. All things are ours and are open to us, said the apostle in Galatians, the third chapter, in verses 14 through 21. Oh, ye Corinthians, our mouths are open to you, our hearts are enlarged, he said in 2 Corinthians 6 and verses 11 through 13. Now for a recompense in your own insides. Be ye also enlarged. Understand, according to Ephesians, the third chapter, what is the length and the breadth and the height and the depth, what the magnitude of this thing really is. And this, with much privilege, comes much responsibility. And so the apostle said, whom we preach, teaching every man, yes, teaching every man, but also warning every man. God has given all people of earth, the Gentile people, you and me, great honor. He's given us great opportunity, but he will one day hold us responsibility or responsible for the awesome responsibility that it brought with us. And so the apostle said, I labor fervently trying to make people know what this mystery is and trying to tell them how sincere and sober a matter it is and how much attention they ought to be giving to it.